You mentioned the battle stations program that you've stood up, this get out the vote effort. When I was at the NRCC uh, back in the 2000 cycle, so two and a half decades ago, we had what we called orphan districts. I think you guys have them now too, which are states where uh, you don't have, a, where the presidential race isn't going to be playing. I mean, you mentioned some of these five key districts, Alaska, uh, Colorado, uh, I, you know, um, and, and, and it, it, you mentioned, I think, Washington State, all places where uh, there's probably not going to be a big presidential race. So what is it that you do and why is that important? That's a good point, Sean, because actually two thirds of our target districts are, as you describe, orphan districts. They're districts where we don't have a competitive Senate race and there isn't a competitive presidential election in that state. So two thirds of our seats. Uh, the, the bad news is there's no infrastructure being built by the national party there. The good news is there's no infrastructure being built by the National Party there. I get to go build the infrastructure. And so we've we've set aside significant resources to do that. As I mentioned, we've already got 35 field offices, battle stations open uh, in these areas. We've got people on the ground building out this infrastructure. Um, and, and what do they do? What do they when they're when they're building out the infrastructure? What is their task? You give them a bunch of money to do what? Well, it's registering voters. It's identifying voters to turn out. You know, I, I want to identify the voter who's definitely going to vote for Donald Trump, is definitely going to vote for Nancy Dahlstrom unless it rains or unless something comes up. You know, those lower propensity voters are the ones that we're really focusing in on to make sure that we uh, either get them out early or at least turn them out on Election Day. So we're using data. Um, we're, we're on the ground knocking doors, making phone calls, reaching out to these voters. Uh, to explain how why it's so important that they have a really competitive election going on and that they need to be a part of it. So if I'm what they call a high propensity voter, I vote in every election, every primary, every student council election, and I'm saying, hey, how come I haven't heard from the NRCC? Is that because you guys, you know, basically look at the data and say I'm not spending 20 bucks on Sean Spicer because I know he's going to vote? That's right. And and we'll monitor to make sure you vote. You know, we're, we're keeping track. So, <laughs> I'll vote. You know, we may call you on election day, but, uh, but no, we, you know, we're, we're counting on you to show up. We want to spend our resources, turn out the others, but, but we are saying to folks like you, Sean, and folks who are, who are uh, listening to us today or watching us, uh, you know, go ahead and vote early. Don't make us spend resources on election day to turn you out. Uh, go ahead and have a plan to vote early to go ahead and bank your vote. Uh, that's the program we're working with the uh, Senatorial Committee and the RNC together. Uh, and uh, President Trump is also very supportive uh, of encouraging Republicans, if you're going to vote anyway, go ahead and bank your vote and vote early. And that means we won't have to spend resources on Election Day turning you out. We can focus on those lower propensity voters. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because here's the thing, and, and you're right. I mean, you, I know you've talked to President Trump about this, but if you don't go vote early, and maybe that means going in person, I don't really care. I don't think you care. Go bank that vote because you're you're going to cost. If you're a, someone that has voted historically, you're just costing the NRCC, the RNC, the Trump campaign money by them having to chase you. And I think that's that's a critical message to send. However you feel comfortable doing it, whether it's mail-in or whatever, or in person, go bank that vote. I mean, that that's what it comes down to, right? It's a dollars and cents issue. Absolutely, and if, if the appeal to your patriotism as a Republican doesn't work, uh, I'll try this. If you will go ahead and vote, you won't get those annoying phone calls <laughs> to election day. We'll stop calling you. So go ahead and vote so you won't have to deal with it. That's that's the other. Yeah, I, I always th tell people if you want the ads to stop, then go vote. But you you mentioned other resources. So I get the the battle stations program that you guys have the get out the vote effort. But when it, it, it you know, let's go back to the to the interview, the pitch, if you will. I'm running in, in Alaska. I'm the former I'm the current lieutenant governor and you're making the pitch to me. What is it that the NRCC says that it can do for me? financially or resource wise, put some meat on that bone and explain what that what that means to me as a potential candidate. Well, I don't want to give away all our secrets, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we 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 do raise money. Uh, we do have the ability to give coordinated funds to these campaigns. Uh, we do have ways to highlight them and help them meet donors and, and, and raise money. Um, we also uh, have ways that we can uh, can split costs with these campaigns to help them keep some of their hard dollars. And so we're employing a whole lot of different, different methods to uh, help them, you know, or we can take some of those costs off of them uh, so that, so they can, you know, 
expand their ability to advertise. And uh, so I won't get into too much detail, but there's a lot of things that, that we, we are. How, how much of it is, is, is advertising? A big part of it. And is that all on air TV or whatever, or is it on mail and phone? I mean, like, how does that break down? How is digital change stuff? Like, are you doing a lot more on, on like Facebook and Google now, or, or how does that work? Yeah, we're doing all the above. And, you know, it's, you've got to have a mix. Uh, part of it depends on where you live. You know, some communities, you've got a lot more cord cutters. And so you've got to reach them with, uh, you know, the OTT techniques that we have now of, of uh, reaching on your devices. And, uh, you know, that's that's part of the mix. Broadcast TV is still king, still pushes numbers the, the best. Uh, but, you know, it's becoming more and more expensive. Uh, it's, it's also, you know, the question of if we do uh, advertising as the NRCC in a, in a particular race, we don't get the lowest rate costs like that candidate does. So that's why you know, partnering with that campaign where we legally are able to and, and driving hard dollars into that campaign so that candidate can do their own advertising, uh, that dollar is going to go a lot further. How about the outside groups? What, what's, what are you guys allowed to do or not do to these, with these super PACs and outside groups? Well, I believe there's some coordination that's allowed on uh, on the get out the vote efforts, but you know, I, for the most part, I'm very careful not to not to uh, to you know to, to communicate with these other outside groups because there's you know a lot of legal constraints, to, and they're good. They're they're good. They protect the American people, protect taxpayers. So we 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 don't coordinate. We don't share plans with any outside groups. I know you guys just announced the latest young guns group of candidates walk us through what does it mean to be a young gun how do you qualify uh and and how could somebody in the future qualify to be a young gun well the young guns program is is our way of signaling these are our best candidates these are the candidates who have have raised significant amounts of money have built a good organization and we think have a real chance of winning and uh and so those those are the campaigns we'll be investing in uh but by by putting that list out there it lets it lets the people know you know, these are solid candidates that you can support. And so we've got, you know, again, I'm really proud of the candidates we've got across the country. You know, people like Gabe Evans in Colorado 8, which is a northern suburb of Denver. You know, he's a 10-year Army helicopter pilot, 10 years as a police officer. Uh, he is a really strong candidate running against a freshman Democrat there. Um, we think uh, we've got a real shot of picking up that seat. So folks like him and, and in my home state of North Carolina, um, Lori Buckout, uh, retired colonel in the army, uh, very successful businesswoman, raised a family. Uh, she is a really strong candidate against another freshman Democrat there in North Carolina. Uh, you know, these are the types of candidates that uh, that we're putting on the field, and they're being highlighted as young guns. So, what what is it? How do how do if I'm running for office right now and I say I'd like to be a young gun, I want to be one of these 26 candidates. What did they What did they have to show the NRCC to make that list? Well, each one, you know, we have different targets based on the cost of their campaigns and, and what we think they need to be raising. Um, but but they all have to have, you know, a good solid campaign team in place. Uh, they've got to show us a, a, a campaign plan that we agree is a winning plan. Uh, they have to demonstrate that, that they're the kind of candidate that can win. And so we, we work with each one individually. Uh, there are a number of folks that will probably be rolled out as young guns in the coming weeks. Uh, who, who reach that threshold where we feel like they're, uh, they're going to be successful. And so we'll, we'll continue to update that list. And so if somebody out there is running for Congress right now and says, I didn't make the list, uh, but I'd like to, do they, do they come to you with hat in hand with data and say, hey, this is how much I've raised. I've got this many volunteers. Here's my campaign team. Here's my plan to win. Are there iterations so that a month from now, two months from now, they can become a young gun? Yes, and, and we're talking to all these campaigns. You know, I mentioned these regional political directors. I mean, they're every day are on the phone with these campaigns. You know, we we are intimately aware of, of the progress they're making, and uh, so there are folks who didn't make the list yet who you know we're still in, in communication with, and we're hoping they get to the point that that we can uh, we can give them that young gun distinction. So let me just uh, let me ask you. I, I think a lot of people wonder how switching out Harris when when she got pushed aside when Biden got pushed aside and they switched out Harris. Does that change the race if you're running for Congress in terms of how you communicate or the issues and and uh, the attacks that you might levy? Is it shifted now to tying them to Harris versus tying them to Biden? It really hadn't changed much because you know. Uh, 
Harris has been there every step of the way with Joe Biden for the last you know, three and a half years. She supported all the policies. Uh, so there really is no daylight between the two. So, and, and, you know, our campaigns are very focused on the issues voters care about. It's the cost of things because of inflation, you know, not just gas and groceries, but, but home heating and cooling. It's, it's health care. I mean, everything that, that families need and consume costs more money. And that's directly tied to the policies of the Biden-Harris administration. It's the open border that, you know, uh, media is trying to rewrite the, the script that, you know, she really wasn't the borders are. Um, inconveniently, we have all these tapes of, of each of the networks saying that she's the new borders are. So it's a little hard for her to run away from it. But, <laughs> but, but she's, you know, she is directly tied to these failed policies at the border and would, would do nothing but double down if she became president. I mean, she's even said that she supports free health care. Uh, you know, she, she's just she, she is a far left San Francisco liberal. And uh, and there, there, there's really no distinction on any of these policies. And so our, our our campaigns are still focused on these issues that the voters care about. And it's just now uh, an issue of connecting the dots to uh, the policies that, that the vice president has supported and the policies that she will pursue as president and tying those uh, together for the voters. So it really hadn't changed anything. Yeah, it's funny. I I saw, I know he's running for the Senate, but Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania did a great job of tying Bob Casey, the incumbent senator there, all of his praise for Kamala Harris to her issues on fracking, to energy, to, uh, you know, all the the aforementioned things that you just mentioned. It's amazing. Like, I mean, they're they're making Bob Casey own Kamala Harris's record there. Um, I want to go back to the map for a second. 435 members of Congress, 218 to get to the majority. You guys have a four seat majority now. How many incumbents are, are running for reelection on both sides? Um, what do you mean in those target seats? I mean, well, no, kind of just what, like, I mean, like, let's just say, what is it like? So you need 218 incumbents to, to take to keep the majority. How many of your incumbents are seeking reelection this cycle? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I've looked at the number that way. We've kind of looked at it the other way around, but but I would just I would I would answer the question this way. You know, Cook Political Report did an analysis, and they determined that Republicans are favored in 201 races, Democrats are favored in 203 races, and so that leaves you know 11 toss-ups on each side that uh, that that are really make up the battlefield. So you know, it's, 218 is the magic number. We're all close, and it's how do you get those last you know, a few seats to, uh, uh, you know, so, so if there's 22 seats in the middle, according to Cook, um, how many of those can we pick up? Um, you know, that's really the question of, of uh, you know, how do you get to 218 and how many above 218 can you go? Um, again, it's, it's not a lot up for grabs. So that, that number is not going to be a huge number, uh, but we feel pretty confident because in those target, those 22 kind of in between seats, uh, the quality of our candidates, the issue sets that we're running on, the fact that we're talking about the issues American people care about, and Kamala Harris is wrong on all these issues. And in, in almost every single case, the incumbents uh, or the candidates we're running against support these policies. So uh, I love the issue set. I love the way the, the map is, is set up for us. I think we're going to be very successful. Um, how many are you, I mean, are you guys on offense on more than they're on offense? Is that, is that a, I, I don't, again, I'm not trying to, but do you guys feel like you have a better map than the Democrats do right now? I do. I mean, if you just look at the, uh, the DCCC's initial layout of media buys versus ours, theirs was a majority on defense. And again, think about this. They're the party in the minority. They're the party that wants to claim the majority and they're spending most of their money on defense. If you look at our races that we laid out, uh, most of our initial buys are on offense. So uh, um, if, if you look at the dollar amounts, because the places we're defending are very expensive, places like New York and L.A., uh, if you look at just purely dollar amounts, it's probably about 50-50 for us. Uh, but if you look at the number of seats that we're targeting, we're more on offense than we are on defense. The last thing I want to ask you is you, you brought up the red wave a, a little while ago. And, and there were the, between the red wave not materializing – and I think a lack of confidence in polling. How confident are you as you head towards November in, in the data that you're getting from pollsters, et cetera, on, on the, the environment and the, 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 the most recent polling uh, showing where your candidates stand? Well, I, I never trust one poll. I look at trends. I think that it's a lot more accurate because, you know, a poll, 
taking a poll is easy if you know exactly who's going to show up on election day. You know, just ask them, and that'll give you an, an exact poll. But but the challenge, obviously, is you don't know who's going to show up on election day, so you have to guess. And so each poll is a snapshot; it's a guess. Uh, but what I look at is trends, and and when trends are all moving in one direction, you can feel pretty confident about it. And I like the trends. You know, I mean, the last two weeks, I saw a headline somewhere, you know, it's been a long century the last two weeks. Um, you know, it's <laughs> just if you think about the astonishing changes in the, in the political world, um, I mean, we had President Trump was shot. Uh, the Democrats just, uh, just successfully pulled off uh, probably the first political coup in America uh, by taking a seated president with 14 million votes and just kind of pushed him aside. Uh, astonishing. Uh, Kamala Harris is now, you know, the second coming of Barack Obama. If you if you turn on the mainstream news, uh, she's going to crash to earth. I mean, the, the realities of, of, of her ineffectiveness as a candidate and her far left San Francisco uh, policies and views. Once the people start to, to get a sense of those, uh, I think you're going to see her come crashing back to earth. And uh, uh, I think you know, we're going to continue to see the trends come our way. I mean, the bottom line is American people are less prosperous and less safe under the Biden-Harris policies, and they know it, and they've, they've made the connection. That's why Joe Biden was the most unpopular president in American history when he was running for re-election. That's why Kamala Harris is the most unpopular vice president in American history. It's because the American people realize their policies have made their lives less safe and less prosperous. So I like the, I like the trends. I think the trends are true. I think we're seeing kind of a, a, a strange time now with all the different things that have happened. Uh, but I think when, as things level set, um, we're going to continue to see the trends move our way. Okay, last thing. I'm sorry, I, I miss. If someone wants to help you keep a House majority, and and understands what's at stake right now, how can they help you best maintain a majority? Well, NRCC.org is the website, uh, and if you want to see my uh, my campaign website, is RichardHudson.org. So you can go to either one of those websites and and get a lot of information on on what we're doing and who our candidates are and you can make a contribution, and we'd appreciate it. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.